Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is one of a group on Joseph Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness. In other episodes, I've said some things about the social and historical context in which the novel was written. I've talked about Conrad's biography, and I've discussed the structure and narrative technique Conrad uses in the novel. Here, I want to examine the critique of capitalism and colonialism presented by Conrad's narrator and protagonist, Charlie Marlowe. Before embarking on his voyage, Marlowe has a cup of tea with his aunt, the aunt who has helped him to get this job. He tells us that she's in a triumphant mood. There has been a lot of talk in the newspapers and in society in general about the civilizing mission, about the need for Europeans to carry the torch of Christianity and civilization to Africa. Marlowe says his aunt has been quite carried away by this propaganda and that she sees him as a kind of a heroic character in this project. Soon, this begins to make Marlowe feel rather uncomfortable, and he ventures to hint that, after all, the company was run for profit. Marlowe ships out on a French steamer passing the west coast of Africa. He feels strange as a passenger on board ship rather than a working seaman, but he is observant and reflective. We pounded along, he says, stopped, landed soldiers, went on landed custom house clerks to levy toll in what looked like a godforsaken wilderness with a tin shed and a flagpole lost in it, landed more soldiers to take care of the customs house clerks, presumably. The idleness of a passenger, my isolation amongst all these men with whom I had no point of contact, the oily and languid sea, the uniform somberness of the coast, seem to keep me away from the truth of things. Life on this French steamer seems quite detached from reality to Marlowe. But he gets a glimpse of reality that he sees coming from the shore. He tells us, Now and then a boat from the shore gave one a momentary contact with reality. It was paddled by black fellows. You could see from afar the white of their eyeballs glistening. They shouted, sang, their bodies streamed with perspiration. They had faces like grotesque masks, these chaps. But they had bone, muscle, a wild vitality, an intense energy of movement that was as natural and as true as the surf along their coast. They wanted no excuse for being there. They were a great comfort to look at. For a time, I would feel I belong still to a world of straightforward facts. But the feeling would not last long. Soon, the disjuncture between what to Marlowe appears the absurd worldview of these European colonialists on their ships and what he sees as the natural reality represented by the Africans and the continent itself is revealed with stark clarity. Marlowe tells us, Once, I remember, we came upon a man of war anchored off the coast. There wasn't even a shed there, and she was shelling the bush. It appears the French had one of their wars going on thereabouts. Her ensign drooped limp like a rag. The muzzles of the long eight-inch guns stuck out all over the low hull. The greasy, shiny swell swung her up lazily and let her down, swaying her thin masts. Pop would go one of the eight-inch guns. A small flame would dart forth and vanish. A little white smoke would disappear. A tiny projectile would give a feeble screech. And nothing happened. Nothing could happen. There was a touch of insanity in the proceeding a sense of lugubrious drollery in the sight. And it was not dissipated by somebody on board assuring me earnestly that there was a camp of natives. He called them enemies, hidden out of sight somewhere. Enemies, this term for the natives, 
is going to become part of a recurring motif in Marlowe's narrative. He reaches his first destination, the colonial outpost at the mouth of the Congo. There's construction work going on. They are dynamiting a hillside in the process of building a railroad. Marlowe says, a slight clinking behind me made me turn my head. Six black men advanced in a file, toiling up the path. They walked erect and slow, balancing small baskets full of earth on their heads, and the clink kept time with their footsteps. Marlow hears a dynamite blast. Another report from the cliff made me think suddenly of that ship of war I had seen firing into a continent. It was the same kind of ominous voice. But these men could by no stretch of imagination be called enemies. They were called criminals, and the outraged law, like the bursting shells, had come to them, an insoluble mystery from over the sea. In another episode, I'll be discussing Marlowe's trip up the Congo River, his eventual encounter with Kurtz, and at the end of the novel, Marlowe's visit to pay his respects to Kurtz's fiance. Here, I'll pass over a section of the novel in order to round off my notice of this motif of the names by which the Europeans casually attempt to justify their brutal treatment of the African natives. The scene is one in which Marlowe has arrived at Kurtz's village. There, he meets another European, a young Russian who has been drawn into Kurtz's spell. He idolizes Kurtz, even though he recognizes at certain moments that Kurtz has gone savagely insane. Marlowe is talking with the young Russian when he sees through his binoculars a row of human heads on stakes in front of Kurtz's cabin. Marlowe says, you remember I told you I had been struck at a distance by certain attempts at ornamentation, rather remarkable in the ruinous aspect of the place. Now I had suddenly a nearer view, and its first result was to make me throw my head back as if before a blow. These round knobs were not ornamental but symbolic. They were expressive and puzzling, striking and disturbing, food for thought, and also for the vultures, if there had been any, looking down from the sky, but at all events for such ants as were industrious enough to ascend the pole. They would have been even more impressive, those heads on the stakes, if their faces had not been turned to the house. Only one, the first I had made out, was facing my way. I am not disclosing any trade secrets. In fact, the manager said afterwards, that Mr. Kurtz's methods had ruined the district. I have no opinion on that point, Marlowe tells us, but I want you clearly to understand that there was nothing exactly profitable about those heads being there. They only showed that Mr. Kurtz lacked restraint in the gratification of his various lusts, that there was something wanting in him, some small matter which when the pressing need arose, could not be found under his magnificent eloquence. The young Russian, the admirer of Mr. Kurtz, Marlowe tells us, was a bit crestfallen. In a hurried, indistinct voice, he began to assure me he had not dared to take these, say, symbols down. I had no idea of the conditions, he said. These heads were the heads of rebels. Rebels! What would be the next definition I was to hear? There had been enemies, criminals, workers, and these were rebels. Those rebellious heads looked very subdued to me on their sticks. In a landmark essay entitled An Image of Africa, first published in 1977, the Nigerian writer Chenwa Achebe 
argued that Heart of Darkness is a profoundly racist novel. As Achebe points out, Conrad paints with a broad brush, depicting an undifferentiated mass of Africans as savage, only to be used as a foil of European civilization. Achebe considers various potentially mitigating factors. Is it that the racist attitudes in the novel are those of the characters, including Charlie Marlowe, and that they are presented with an ironic perspective? Achebe thinks not. In his view, Conrad provides no stable critical perspective to provide a sanction for the reader to interpret Marlowe's attitudes with some distance. Achebe writes, Heart of Darkness projects the image of Africa as the other world, the antithesis of Europe and therefore of civilization, a place where man's vaunted intelligence and refinement are finally mocked by triumphant bestiality. I think Achebe's critique must be kept in mind as one reads Art of Darkness. And from the perspective of our later historical moment, we, the readers, can supply that perspective of irony that Achebe found lacking in the novel. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But, as always, if you have questions or comments, send me an email. Music